Hello, welcome to Morning Manna, June the 20th, 2021. Let us pray. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we can continue our study today. We're grateful for what we've learned in the past, and we are thankful that you will continue to point us in the right direction always. We ask that you would fill us with understanding so that we might be able to share this truth with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our subject for today is Christ's second coming. And we continue to look at Bible readings for the Home Circle, published in 1889. The subject for today, on June the 20th, Christ's second coming. First question. What promise did Christ make concerning his coming? John 1, John 14, verses 1 through 3 says, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Following the signs of his coming, what did Christ say would take place? Luke 21 and verse 27 says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. Question. Will the world be prepared to meet him? Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 says, Well, actually, first, let us read Matthew 24 and verse 30, which says, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they that shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. That's Matthew 24 and verse 30. And then, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 7 says, Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. So the truth of the matter is that the world will be surprised when they see him come. Question, why will many not be prepared for this event? Matthew 24, verses 48 through 51 says, But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, and shall begin to smite his fellow servants, and to eat and drink with the drunken, the Lord of that servant shall come in a day that he looketh not for him, and in an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him of asunder, and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Question. What will the world be doing when Christ does come? Well, verses 37 and 39 says, But as in, in, in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the, those days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not till the flood came, and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. And then, of course, in Luke chapter 17, verses 28 through 30, it says, Likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they builded, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the days when the Son of Man be revealed. Notice that the idea is not that it is wrong in itself to eat, drink, marry, buy, sell, plant, or build but that men's minds will be so taken up with these things that they will give little or no thought to the future life and make no plans or preparation to meet Jesus when he comes. Question. Who is it that blinds men to the gospel of Christ? 2 Corinthians chapter 4 
and verse 4 says, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, which is the image of God, should shine unto them. Notice that to my mind this precious doctrine, for such I must call it, of the return of Christ to this earth is taught in the New Testament as clearly as any other doctrine is yet. I was in the church 15 or 16 years before I ever heard a sermon on it. There is hardly any church that does not make a great deal of baptism. But in all of Paul's epistles, I believe baptism is spoken of only 13 times, while it speaks about the return of our Lord 50 times. And yet the church, he has had very little to say about it. Now I can see a reason for this. The devil does not want us to see this truth, for nothing would make up the church more. The moment a man takes hold of the truth, that Jesus is coming back again to receive his followers to himself. This world loves its hold on him. God seeks to prepare us for the time to come. Satan seeks to distract us in gas stocks and water stocks and stocks in the banks and railroads are of very much less consequence to us now if we are looking for the coming of the Lord. A man's heart is free, and he looks for the blessed appearing of the Lord if he looks forward to the coming of Christ. And his coming will take him into the blessed kingdom if he seeks only that, that great day. This same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven, says the Bible, shall show come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven, is the parting promise of Jesus to his disciples, communicated through the two men in white apparel, as a cloud received him out of their sight, when after more than 50 years in glory, he breaks the silence and speaks once more to the revelation which he gave to his servant John. The post-ascension gospel, which he sends, opens with, Behold, he cometh with clouds and closes with, Surely I come quickly. And of course, that is a reference to the book Revelation. Considering the solemn emphasis thus laid upon this doctrine, and considering the great prominence given to it throughout the teaching of our Lord and his apostles, how was it that for the first five years of my pastoral life, it had absolutely no place in my preaching? Undoubtedly, the reason lay in the lack of early instruction of all the sermons heard from childhood on. I do not remember listening to a single one upon this subject. And that is found in the book, How Christ Came to the Church. And it's written by A.J. Gordon in his book, as I said before, How Christ Came to the Church. And he's saying that for many years he was a member of the church that he was a member of, and he never heard a sermon on the coming of the Lord. What a serious matter that is. Question. At his ascension, what assurance was given to Christ's return? Acts chapter 1, verses 10 and 11 says, And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in a like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Question. How ancient is this doctrine of Christ's coming? Jude chapter 14 and verse 15. Well, Jude verses 14 and 15 says, and Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment upon all. And of course, as I said before, that is found in Jude, verses 14 and 15. 
Notice that seeking to cast reflection upon modern believers in the Advent doctrine, a man in Hungary not long ago remarked to a culporter of his faith that he had heard that the first Advent preacher is still living. Yes, replied the culporter, the first Adventist preacher is still living, yet the Adventist faith is thousands of years old. The Bible says that Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, preached the coming of Christ in glory and power, and Enoch is still living. He was translated to heaven without seeing death and will never die. Question. What was Job's confidence concerning Christ's return? Job 14. And also you can find this in Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, which says, For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth, whom I shall ye see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another, though my reins be consumed within me. And that was Job chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. Question. How does David speak of Christ's coming? Psalm 96 and verse 13 says, Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. That's Psalm 50 and verse 30. Verse 3. And then we get to Psalm 96 and verse 13. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. So those are two texts from the book of Psalms. The first one, Psalm 30, Psalm 50, and verse 3. Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him. And it shall be very tempestuous round about him. That's Psalm 50 and verse 3. And then Psalm 96 and verse 13. For he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. Question. How does Paul give expression to this hope? Philemon 3 and verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Titus 2 and verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Question, what is Peter's testimony regarding it? 2 Peter 1 and verse 16. For we shall not fo- follow, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we were made known unto us the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That is Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. Question. When are the saints to be like Jesus? First John 3 and verse 2 says, Believed, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Now, I know that many of you have memorized that text, and it's such a beautiful text, as it is a group of individuals who believe in the Lord speaking to one another. 1 John 3 and verse 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when we shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Question. What scriptures show that Christ's coming will be a time of reward? The first text is, Matthew 16 and verse 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. That's Matthew 16 and verse 27. And then there's Revelation chapter 22 and verse 12. 
and behold, I come quickly. And my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Question. To whom is salvation promised at Christ's appearing? Hebrews 9 and verse 28 says, So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Question. What influence has this hope upon the life? 1 John 3 Verses 2 and 3 says, For we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. So to whom does Paul say a crown of righteousness is promised? Well, notice this. 2 Timothy chapter 4 Verses 6 through 8 says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that also love his appearing. So what will the waiting ones say when Jesus comes? Isaiah 25 and verse 9 says, And it shall be said in that day, Lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Question. Has the exact time of Christ's coming been revealed? Matthew 24 and verse 36 says, But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. In what view of this fact, what does Christ tell us to do? Matthew 24 and verse 42 says, Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. In the scriptures, the constant note, the continually recurring exhortation is to be prepared for the Lord's coming. The proper attitude of a Christian is to be always looking for his Lord's return. Question, what warning has Christ given that we might not be taken by surprise by this great event? Now notice this text. It's found in Luke chapter 21 verses 34 through 36. And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life. And so that day come upon you unawares. For as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch ye therefore, and pray always, that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of God. Finally, what Christian grace are we exhorted to exercise in order to be a longing for the advent and looking forward to it? James chapter 5, verses 7 and 8 says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord, Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he receive the early and the latter rain. Be ye therefore also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Recalled to be patient. Recalled to patiently look forward to his coming. Recalled to surrender our lives to him so that he might make the transformation in our hearts that is so necessary to be made. We're given an opportunity to come with a humility and a repentant spirit, asking for forgiveness for all that we have done, which was not according 
to the will of God. We've been given an opportunity again, a probationary period, to do the work that needs to be done. And once we've done this, to patiently wait for our Lord to come. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the counsel that you give. We thank you for your mercy and for your grace. And and today we ask that you would help us, please, to surrender our lives to you. Come with an attitude of humility and repentance, asking for forgiveness for the time we have wasted and the opportunities we have overlooked. Fill us with your truth and do the work within us that needs to be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This has been Morning Manor, June the 20th, 2021.